Welcome to the PA Books Podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This week on PA Books, Letitia Stewart Savage, author of Horns and Kaufmans. Letitia Stewart Savage, you've written two books about Pittsburgh's great downtown department stores, Horns and Kaufmans. What's your fascination with department stores? Um, I had shopped there, and the Kaufmans book actually, I don't know that I had an overwhelming. Um, interest in department stores, but it's really, you can get interested in almost anything if the raw material's there. And I was actually watching your PA book show on one of the department store series books. You mentioned Pomeroy's. Right, Pomeroy's has it. And Michael Lipinski, I think, was the author. And he brought up the number of department stores in Pittsburgh. And he, and, he, and he said, and nobody's written about these. And he looked at the camera and he said, so if there's a freelance writer in Pittsburgh looking for a project, look into Kaufman's. And I thought, okay, that could be interesting. Um, found out that the store archives were in the History Center, the Heinz History Center, and there was enough raw material there to make a book. So I went ahead and proposed it and um, Arcadia History Press um, thought it would be a good addition to the department store series. And then once you get into the, it's like the department stores are a really fascinating just from their history and what it says about shopping and social history and how people live. But Pittsburgh had more department stores than any other city of a comparable size, I think back in the late 19th, early 20th century. And so many of them have just completely disappeared. Your dedication of your Kaufman's book is for my mother who introduced us to Kaufman's shopping and lunch at the TikTok. What do you remember about being oh, a kid and going to Kaufman's? My dad worked in the city, so it was really easy to get a bus from suburbia, come downtown, shop, stop by, hit him up for lunch, and often then it was like the TikTok or some other um, either department store or and then get a ride home with him. So we had a routine where we'd come down and first store was Horns, shop there, hit Jenkins Arcade, which has also disappeared, but was a wonderful place of lots of little tiny specialty shops. Then Kaufman's for lunch, wrap up anything else, and then um, basically bum a ride home with him from um, his office. Is that what people would do? Would they, they shop at both, or were there tended to be Kaufman's families and Horn's families? I think they shopped at both, because most of the people that I talk to talk about doing a routine. And depending on when you shopped and how many stores were in town, um, people hit um, Gimbel's, which it depended on, I think it depended on, some of it might have been a little bit like class and family tradition. Some people would do Kaufman's first, some people did Horns first, and there was Gimbel's, Rosenbaum's, which was out of business by the time we moved to Pittsburgh. Um, there was a Kaufman and Bear that became Gimbel's, that again was out of business by the time I moved to Pittsburgh, and then Boggs and Buell over in Allegheny, which was at least in our family lore, that was like the premier, high-end, elegant store because it had started in Allegheny, which was the um, one of the moneyed neighborhoods of Pittsburgh when it was um, residential. And then it was like such a nice store. People would like, you'd have to go across the bridge to get there, so it was worth the trip. But they were out of business, too, by the time I moved here. But I think it depended on maybe what was a family tradition. And Kaufman's in many ways was not, was a little bit more 
modern than horns and maybe not as intimidating because it didn't have the carriage trade reputation. Well, I want to read you about horns and I want to ask about the, the two different personalities that the stores had and you write in your introduction to the horns book visiting the store was like visiting a proper genteel old older aunt who was surrounded by comfortable gently worn things. Yes. We moved to Pittsburgh in the late 1960s. So when you went to Horns in the 1960s, that in this first floor store interior um, pr had a lot of the, the infrastructure left over, I think probably from the 1920s and 1930s. So I remember there were marble steps up from the main store to the mezzanine. And the marble was so worn that there were divots in the marble. Um, you didn't see that at Kaufman's. Kaufman's upgraded or modernized their store in the 1950s, and, their, um, and they had a fantastic 1930s Art Deco first floor that was completely dismantled in that 1950s um, upgrade. So it was a totally different, I mean, Horns you was definitely, um, you got the sense that it was a much older store, but that was fine with them. And it was fine with their shoppers. Did one of them go for bargains and the other for higher end, or was it a mix? Um, I think Kaufman started as more of a bargain store. I think their roots were there. Um, Horn started as a trimming store, and then it became dry goods, but they definitely went after what they called the carriage trade at that point, so they um, they did not sell on price, I don't think, as much as they did on quality. Kaufman's started off as more of a bargain store. I want to read this. You say, to emphasize their selling philosophy, they called their store Kaufman's 5% Profit Mammoth Clothing Emporium. Right. And it, that's when Catchy it was... Catchy name. <laughs> yeah. And their ads, their advertisements were so totally different that the Kaufman's ads emphasized price, bargain, um, and one of the things they did, and sadly there were no photographs of this, they decided as a marketing thing to have what they called a clothing drop. <laughs> and they, and the, the clothing was packaged, but they threw bundles of clothing out of the upper sto store windows into the crowds below, and it was all free. And it created such a huge riot that um, they were in trouble with the police and they never did it again. <laughs> but they were, and now as years passed and they, start, they started competing with Kaufman's, or with Horns, especially under um, Edgar Kaufman, I think they, they brought the quality up as they were going head to head. Um, I have to read you this, what you wrote about the great clothing shower. 5,000 pieces of clothing were to be thrown from the roof. 18,000 people gathered in front of the store. This is 1883. And uh, 35 policemen broke up what had become a near riot. Yeah, and they never <laughs> tried it again. And I, that, that whole, as a marketing ploy, that would have been complete anathema, the horns. It never, the horns, the, the horns management and families would have been appalled at something like that. Well, Horns did not advertise on Sundays? Is no. that right? They were the For ones many, that... many, many years, they never advertised on Sundays. And they had um, curtains on the show windows. And I think it was maybe World War II. It was probably at least, I think, through the 1930s that they drew those curtains on Sunday because they didn't want people, they didn't think it was proper for people to window shop on a Sunday when they should be doing like more serious things. Were the stores open six days a week? Back in those days, yes, although I think in the summers they did half days on some of the summer Saturdays. So the employees got at least a half day. Now Horns, you say, was founded in 1849? Yes. First of all, who was Mr. Horn who founded it? Um, he was, he came from a farming family in eastern, well central Pennsylvania, Bedford, and I think he was working as a clerk in a local store in Bedford and then decided to strike out for Pittsburgh 
I think that was 1849, and Pittsburgh was just like a huge, huge growing city. And then got a job in a trimming store in Market Street, and then eventually was able to either, I think he eventually bought out, he went into partnership and then bought out the partner. What was the retail business like when he got into it? Um, and he did retail and wholesale. Um, I think a lot of specialty shops, they didn't have department stores yet. So, um, and in a city, you would moved beyond like a country store. So you didn't have like the local small country store or, you know, trading store or whatever that pretty much sold everything. But they were starting, they specialized. So his first store sold mostly trimmings, lace, I think gloves, um, but no fabric. So he was just doing trimmings. What's trimmings? Um, this is like, and that's like totally foreign to us today because our clothing is not decorated like this. But pre-Civil War, Civil War, um, the women's dresses were so um, ornately decorated that, and if you look at pictures like in um, Godey's Ladies Book, um, they were using silk braid, woven horsehair, wool, lace, um, to trim all the way around the skirts, multiple layers on the skirts, the sleeves, the bodices, and you would have, um, if you would go today to recreate like an 1850s dress, 15 to 20 yards of trimming just to trim, another eight to 10 yards of fabric for the dress. You say somewhere in this book that one of the things they sold was hoop skirts. Yeah, yeah which hoop skirts are very hard to make. Um, hard to wear too, I guess. Yes, <laughs> and we do, um, we're doing 19th century living history, so yes, I've actually worn hoop skirts. I tried making them, they're really hard to make, they're much nicer to buy. How wide are they at the bottom? Um, it depends on whether you want a day dress hoop or an evening dress hoop, but they can be from six feet to about 10 feet. So, how do you go through a door? Sideways. You have to actually learn how to maneuver your hoop so that you can get through a door, get up a flight of stairs, sit down without the hoop flying up. Um, it can be sort of an annoyance. And a lot of people who are more practical, they're very hard to work in. So, if you were actually a working person, I don't think you wore them very much. But if you're elite enough to just sort of be decorative, you can wear your hoop skirt in the day. What was going on in Pittsburgh in 1849 when Mr. Oh, Horn started his store? I think Pittsburgh at, at that point was growing like leaps and bounds. They had had a fire, but Pittsburgh was becoming the center, more of a center of industry. So a lot of the industries like I'm not sure if how much steel had taken off, but glass was a huge industry. And then also the supplying of all of the people who were using the Ohio River to get to the Mississippi and then get farther west. So boat building was a huge industry. And all of that um, you know, pretty much was a, like an economic sponge for people to come in and start all kinds of new businesses. At what point did Horns become something that you might call a department store? I think it was probably late 19th century. Um, they started carrying fabric, and then I think they, the, during about the 1890s, the historians say that the real driver for, to department stores from dry goods was when they started to offer um, ready-to-wear clothing, and that happened around the turn of the century. Something we take for granted now. Yeah, um, but before about 1890, 1910, when the fashions changed and it became, they were simpler so it was easier to mass produce, then it was easier for the, like the, fa the um, entire manuf clothing manufacturing industries in places like New York took off. And that's when you have the you know, the start of the sweatshops and the shirtwaist factories, but that was driving 
a lot of the department stores because they could now carry ready-to-wear clothing. And you say that most of the shoppers for ready-to-wear clothing were women shopping yes. for their husbands. Um, and children. Um, although Horns had a really strong um, men's furnishings department and reputation, and they even had a separate store entrance for, I think, decades, where the men could be dropped off right outside the building, enter the door into the men's department, and not have to deal with, I think there was a description of petticoats and perfumery. They didn't have to deal with women shoppers. And I think one of the ads for that department showed the man's chauffeur dropping him off. And they kept longer hours so that he could shop after his busy day of business in the city. But can, can you explain the, the system you describe in your book about what, if you wanted to buy something, how you would pay for it? Um, assuming if you were the chosen, a chosen um, small percentage, you would have credit. And they would just put it on your credit account and you just you know credit this to um, whatever husband name and they would put it on your credit account and bill you twice a year. If you did not have credit, and it was very hard to get at the time, you would pay um, at a central cashier, but you didn't actually go up there and pay. The clerk wrote out a little slip. You, the clerk took the slip, took your money, and called a cash boy or girl. Most of them were boys, but there were some girls. And then the cash boy or girl ran that slip and cash to the central cashier and came back with your change. And that, that, I think that was one of the most fascinating things of this research was the whole cash boy system. Because they were as young as, I think, 10 and 12. And it was a, if, if, if you, apart from the whole issue of child labor, um, it was a very good entrance into the retail career for a young man. You also write in, in this is 1865, uh, shoppers did not select their own merchandise from displays. Instead, clerks would bring items from drawers and shelves for them to examine. Prices for items could, be, could vary based on what the clerk thought the shoppers would pay, and sellers and buyers would negotiate a price. Right. And I think Horns was one of the very first that did one price for all shoppers. So you didn't have to negotiate and then you didn't have to feel that the clerk was looking to kind of make judgments about your financial background and how much you'd be willing to pay. What do ads look like? Um, very simple um, in the early days, probably kind of boring compared to Kaufman's. Mm -hmm. Kaufman's ads were um, Kaufman's ads were almost like worth reading just for the ads because they were so graphic and the language was just so over the top. But Horns was very proper and stayed. And often it was just, like many of the other dry goods stores, it would just be a listing of, we offer the following merchandise to our um, shoppers. And then it would just be a list of everything for sale and that was it. No graphics, no screaming headlines, where the Kaufman's ads might have had, oh, I don't even know what point type, 30, like 70 point type, you know, we're having a sale. And the first, first 100 people who come and buy a boy's suit will get a free watch, you know, that kind of thing. It was a totally different, um, I guess, public face of kind of the store culture. Where did you find all these archives for the store? Uh, and what's it like plowing through them? Um, the ads were, um, I found most of them online, which mm. one of the great bargains um, for researchers, f for us were the Post-Gazette archives in Pittsburgh, because as the Post-Gazette um, bought or incorporated other newspapers, going back, I think their archives go back to 1795. They scanned all of those and made them available electronically. 
so you can actually shop in 1954 um, and get you can get terribly terribly sidetracked in those archives but I was able to find all of the Kaufman's ads and I think all of the Horn's ads um, right there right on the computer um, electronically able to save them was that was it took a hours and hours of going through archives but it was very pleasant the other was days hours and days of going through boxes another thing that you talk about is delivery I mean you they had a big delivery system that sounds like it Huge. rivals UPS today yeah and it was um, and I think for both stores it was originally horse based to the point where Horns had its own big stables and I think Kaufman's did too and I think they had probably a hundred or more horses in the delivery service which meant they had to employ I think they employed their own harness makers and wagon repair men and um, Barriers to do the shoes and all the people to take care of the horses and that was very um, very labor intensive very expensive so as soon as they could um, move into something more mechanical they did that and Kaufman's and Horns both kind of did the we were first with the trucks I think Horns probably was first but if Kaufman's claimed it the Horns didn't argue I do have to mention this one. I, I don't know if I have the year here, but you uh, say at one point they used wheelbarrows mm -hmm. to deliver. The first Horns deliveries were wheelbarrows because, and that was, I think, 1849 to maybe Civil War, maybe a little bit of post-Civil War, but Pittsburgh was so centralized and it was still residential downtown. So you could put packages on a wheelbarrow and run them to the residential districts in the city. And then I think they also ran them across the bridges into Allegheny. And then they had their first wheelbarrow delivery um, person was a black man um, who became part of kind of like the store's um, legend for good or bad. Um, and then he was replaced by boys who I think they called them um, stocky boys but very motivated boys and then they would run the I think they were running wheelbarrows as far as Allegheny and then up into what would now be um, the Hill District in Pittsburgh and then as soon as they been and then those the wheelbarrows were replaced with the horses and then horses with trucks and then they also used rail delivery um, as, as they called the outlying areas. I mean, my neighborhood is an outlying area. Um, the packages went on the train to what would be suburbia, and then a local subcontracted wagon company would deliver to the houses. You say in some cases you could go to the store and buy something and have it delivered, and it would be yes. at your house before you got home at yes. the end of the day. And they were delivering, I think, they were delivering maybe three or four times a day because during, when I think it was World War I, when they first started to have to curtail some of the delivery because of the, um, I'm not sure if it was fuel or what it was. World War II, it was definitely a fuel issue. But in World War I, for um, economic reasons they asked people to start carrying their own packages and they started limiting the delivery I think to maybe once or twice a day. Well, you started off by saying when, when it was first started Mr. Horn, Joseph Horn was mm -hmm. his name, um, also had a wholesale business. Yes. Who did he wholesale to? What kind of stuff um, did he He's sell? wholesaled and he, I think he wholesaled to um, at least across Pennsylvania I think it was mostly regional, but he wholesaled to other retailers. So if you had a country store and you wanted to carry some trimmings in your country store, you could buy from him wholesale. And that became a big enough piece of the business that it ended up being moved away from retail to its own, I think a four-story building. 
And then when Joseph Horn died and they split the business, I think the wholesale piece was sold off. And I don't think Kaufman's ever did anything wholesale. They were retail from the beginning. Well, we are sitting in uh, our studio in Gateway Center, and right across the street from here is what had been the Horns building. Right. Um, when did that open, and what was it like? Um, I think that was the late 1890s. It was a little hard to keep track of which building they started with, because they, they expanded from about 1890 into the early 20th century, and then they had a horrific fire. So they built a showcase um, store that was going to be there. You know, this is, this is our big store, this is as big as we need. It was destroyed in a horrific fire. So they expanded after the fire, and then I think they continued to expand like through the 1920s. So the store kept um, its basic footprint it just, and location. It just got slightly bigger, and then the exterior trim changed over the years. So, so the Horns building, if you walked in the front door, what would the experience have been like? Um, and I did take a side trip on my way here to check out Highmark and see if there was anything left. That's what's in the building now? Yeah, and it's, I mean, I understand why they wouldn't retain that what was considered the last classic department store interior in Pittsburgh. And you basically walked in, they had brass doors. Back in the day, they had porters and doormen who would actually open the doors for you. And then the main door, if I remember, um, huge interior space, probably two stories high, with marble columns, and then the marble columns went all the way up to the ceiling. And by the time I saw it, they had installed air conditioning and some other things, so, it, so there were, was some ductwork in the ceiling. But an ornamental plaster ceiling, which I think at some place, points had been gilded, marble floors, and when the first sto store first opened, all of the fittings in the first floor were carved walnut with gilding, so it was very much this grand entry space with marble steps to a mezzanine where by the time I visited the store, the mezzanine was where the store services were located. So I think there was the, like the ladies' restroom and lounge and travel service and that kind of thing on the, the mezzanine, but it was very much this grand, ornate space and that was designed that way to kind of give you the grandeur of the store and as you got up as you traveled up in the floors um, the spaces got smaller until when I think they had offices on the top floors but the the things that people would seek out so if you thought every people were coming for fabric you put that in the upper floor, so they had to go past everything else to get to fabric, and then they could be sidetracked and shop on the way. And then first floor was um, impulse items. Did they have elevators right in the yes. beginning? Yes. Um, oh. Not sure when the elevators were installed. I think early 20th century. And you also talked about one of them boasted as having the first escalator in Pittsburgh, and the other boasted as being the first to have air conditioning. Right. and. Horns, I think, actually did have the first air conditioning, although Kaufman's claimed it. It's kind of hard to keep track of who really was first, but Kaufman's did a huge announcement when they got escalators. Um, Horns also had escalators. And until, I think even as late as Macy's, if you went on to the, when, when, when Macy's was still in the Kaufman's building, um, you could go up in the upper floors and you could actually still ride the original wooden escalators. They weren't metal, they were like wood slats and they made like a real clackety sound. But those were only on the uppermost floors, I think again maybe offices. What was it like to work for them? Um, 
from what I could gather, people really, that was one of their, um, they had very, very loyal employees, both stores. Um, Horns had a 50-year club where employees who had been with the store for 50 years joined, and at one point they had, oh, I probably, dozens of people in the 50-year club. And many of them, I thought it would, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s, a lot of the 50-year employees had started out as cash boys. So when the store, um, because of public, there was a lot of public pressure about child labor, that um, the store did away with what they called the junior help and replaced the cash boys with the pneumatic, those pneumatic tubes. Like I think they still use them at banks. Mm -hmm. But they replaced the cash boys with the tubes that ran the cash. But they didn't just wholesale put the cash boys out on the street. They were, must have been moved to other places in the store because some of the very senior members of store management in the 50-year club had started as cash boys. Were they family sustaining jobs? Yes, yes. That was the other thing that was um, fascinating was that everybody thinks department store and they think department store clerk. But behind the department store clerk, and this is both Kaufman's and Horn's because they did a lot of their own manufacturing, um, all kinds of jobs were available, um, including um, they had their own print shops, they had their own furniture repair and construction, um, deliveries, mechanics working on the, the delivery trucks. It was a pretty much a, like a, a more of a major industry than you'd actually think. I think far more than retail is today. Did they hire women? Um, yes, although not women clerks at first. Um, I think the women were hired, um, like large staffs of women, to do um, the dressmaking, um, repair, alterations, manufacturing of clothing, and then the women, once the whole once the focus of the business of the retail became uh, ready to wear, like women's ready to wear, and not fabric, was when the women started to really be able to move in into clerk jobs, um, fashion jobs, buyers. Um, so f for the time, it was a good career for women. So women could move up in the company? Yes, and some of them moved up pretty considerably, um, particularly as this, I think maybe a little, maybe equal, but Horns had um, a whole fashion department. So they had a head of the fashion department, and the multiple heads of the fashion department were very visible in the city, in the press, you know, multiple trips to Europe, um, having their their brains picked in feature articles about what you know the the spring the spring fashion shows in Paris, um, kind of not what we really see much in retail today. And you mentioned the one African American they hired. Were there others? Um, yes, although again, um, the road in for a lot of the African American workers were things like. The, um, not necessarily clerking or on the front face of the store, but um, porters. There were some that were, there was a, several like beloved porter doormen who were very visible. Um, manufacturing, food service, um, more the jobs like that. I think it was probably, oh, 60s, 70s, 80s before you started to see um, more African American workers at like the front face of the store. You you write about uh, Kaufman's um, fashion fashion journal, which is like a catalog that you yeah. order from, and then they had <clears throat> you could phone in orders. Yes, and you could phone in orders at both stores, and the phone in orders 
They had phone-in orders and they also had mail-in orders. And I'm trying to think, we picked up a, maybe circa 1909, agricultural magazine that I think was published out of New York State or somewhere in Ohio. And Horns advertised in there. You could actually send for the catalog and then from the catalog make a mail order and then it would be shipped to you. The Kaufmans who were, the Kaufmans department store, they were the uh, Falling Water Kaufmans? Yes. Yes. That, um, and that's why I said they had a little bit more of a, of a modern emphasis to the store. They were seen as modern so that when they did that, um, when they did the 1930 Art Deco um, reconstruction renovation of the ground floor and I think some of the upper floors of the store, that was leading edge 1930s Art Deco. It was beautiful. And I think um, that was led by Edgar Kaufman, who also built Falling Water. And he had, um, he had Frank Lloyd Wright do the design and all the furniture for his office in Kaufman's. And yet, when they did the reconstruction in the 1950s to be modern and took that all away, um, I don't think they realized how... I don't, I don't know if I want to say destructive, but that would horns would have gone, the 1930s interior still works, so we're not going to touch it. And I'm not sure where the Frank Lloyd Wright office ended up. I think it may be in an art gallery somewhere, but it left, I believe it left Pittsburgh. But yes, he was the, there were three founding Kaufman's brothers, and his father was one of the three, and because of either the uncles were childless or there was family tragedy, he, Edgar Kaufman was pretty much left as the only one of his generation, and I think he basically bought out his uncles, and then he became um, probably the driving influence of the store. Did both stores have restaurants? Um, yes. Kaufman's has got a lot more public attention and still does because of the TikTok shop, but I don't think that was set up until the 1950s. And they had had a white tablecloth restaurant before that, as had Horns. Horns had its tea room, and it was kind of hard to track the history particularly of the Horns restaurant, because it seemed to move from within the store as they renovated and they changed, um, I think it was on one of the upper floors, and then they moved it to a lower floor, and I think it was on the lower floor when they put in the um, heavy duty flood protection after the 1936 flood. Oh, they had floods a couple times. Oh, they had. About. I think they had a 1907 flood, which they were able to, um, they were pretty much to keep the water out of the store. And then they upgraded their flood control after that flood, but the 36 flood was so high that it actually topped the flood control, um, the flood control protection that they had. And Kaufman's, because it was farther up the hill, like farther away from the rivers, um, Kaufman's never um, was flooded, and they were actually a, like a relief supply collection point during the 1936 flood. And Horns, I think, had been flooded. I think they lost everything on the first floor. They had a basement fl store, lost everything there, lost everything on the first floor, and I forget how long they were closed until they were able to reopen. You want to get back to the TikTok because you, you mentioned that in your introduction or your dedication to the Kaufman's book. Uh, you remember going to the TikTok. Oh, yeah. What was, what was distinctive about it? Well, it had a clock theme. And actually, we ended up at the suburban stores 
probably shopping more than the downtown stores. And both Horns and Kaufman's moved to the suburbs. So we had the freestanding Kaufman's in the North Hills and they had a TikTok shop. So it was really easy to go shopping on a Saturday morning and then make sure you ended up there for lunch. So they had, um, and different people like different things, but they were, excuse me, really well known for desserts. So they had coconut cake. I think they had an ice cream pie. I think they had a mile high ice cream pie, which I don't remember ever eating, probably because I wasn't a huge pie fan. And then, but it was just basic, um, kind of like lunchtime comfort food um, for more of like the lady shoppers. So you could get tea sandwiches, you could get fruit salad you could get, and this is probably, I'm waiting for somebody to um, rediscover this, the, the jello fruit molds, with the, like the jello salads with the little fruit molds and on lettuce. So it was very much like ladies who lunch kind of fare, but they were really well known for their desserts. I have to, we're jumping around a little bit, but I have to ask about this, a time that that uh, Kaufman's brought in Harry Houdini. Oh, and there were no pictures of that. And I looked through the whole Post-Gazette archive, hoping there would be a picture. And there was no picture where Harry Houdini came to Pittsburgh and to make the extra strong crate that he couldn't get out of. They asked the packing department at Kaufman's to build the crate, which the packing department did but there was apparently no photograph of it. And I believe Houdini still got out of the crate, but that was like one of their big public things that they built the crate. Another celebrity involved in these stores was uh, Andy Warhol. Oh yeah, he was a window dresser yeah, at Warhol. Yeah, he was a part-time employee in the display department when he was a student at Carnegie. And that would have been, I think there's one piece that he kept of one of his windows, and I think it's maybe flowers on a piece of wallboard that I think is in, I don't know that it's on display, I think it has been on display, but it's actually at the Warhol. Uh, and it, it may be, you know, back in storage, but I think that's the only piece he took when he left Horns, and he only worked one summer. Now, I, I have to ask about this one because um, the first commercial radio station was in Pittsburgh in 1920, and in January of 1921, Horns started looking into doing ra a radio program, and they did a, a weekly fashion radio program. Right, over um, KDKA, although I don't think it was called KDKA at the time. How can you do a fashion show over the radio? Um, it was like a radio... Um, I don't know if they gave like fashion updates from the fashion shows or they answered questions or they did, but it was probably more of a parallel to the newspaper columns covering fashion. And I don't know if, I think they may have done some fashion shows on television when television first debuted, but Horns had a long standing um, like partnership with Westinghouse, uh, particularly selling a lot of the Westinghouse um, household appliances, which that's another thing that's probably like gone by the wayside in popular, you know, except for people who collect vintage kitchen stuff. People probably don't realize how much uh, Westinghouse household appliances were a part of that business. How did the stores, Horns and Kaufman's, fare during the Depression? Um, I think they were able to basically keep their head above water, but it almost looked like it became kind of, kind of skewed. In other words, there were people who had money, and they were still able to shop at places like Kaufman's Vendome and the high-end um, the high-end merchandise that came into Horns, but generally the, um, the Depression really hit Pittsburgh hard, and you could tell that the stores were starting to offer um, 
cheaper quality, uh, like women's re ready to wear, they were offering um, a little bit cheaper quality cotton dresses as opposed to silk. Um, they were introducing, I think, some of the artificial, like the artificial silk, um, starting to do services where you could have your shoes rebuilt. And Horns, I'm not sure if Kaufman's had their bargain store before the Depression, but that was when Horns started to do the, bargains, the bargain store in the basement, although they didn't, I don't think they called it their bargain store. The idea was that it was for their regular shoppers who were more concerned about the family budget. So they never came right out and said, we know you're really struggling and you're poor. So you may not be able to shop like you used to shop, come to our bargain store. Uh, they basically said it's the same Horns merchandise that you're used to buying now when you're more economic uh, situation. Could rank and file steel workers afford to shop at Horns and Kaufman's? I think so. Although probably Kaufman's definitely. Um, and they also, they tried to keep their stores open long enough that rank and file people could shop. And then as they moved into suburbia, um, the stores were positioning the suburban locations in line with where the steel um, industries were. So there was, and this would have been 50s, 60s, so there would have been horns out in Beaver Valley. Um, I think there was a horns in, um, that was positioned near PPG um, up the Allegheny and into the South Hills. But I think they would have been, people could shop there. It might have been a tad intimidating um, Horns was probably much more geared to the middle management, professional people, middle management in the steel industries. Did the suburban stores hurt the downtown stores? People, like, people discuss whether they hurt or they didn't hurt. I think the, the theory at the time was that you will set up the suburban stores and then people will become familiar with them and then come downtown. But that didn't happen. People ended up going to the suburban stores primarily, although at least with the North Hills, we had a Horns and we had a Kaufman's. But if you wanted certain types of merchandise, you just could not, the, the merchandise in the suburban stores was limited. So if you wanted specific things or high-end things take, to take advantage of say the Horns Bridal Salon, you had to come downtown. Did the fact that people were driving their own cars hurt the downtown stores? Yeah, the, one of the big issues for the downtown stores, and it's still a Pittsburgh issue, is parking. So when people discovered that you can drive to the suburban stores and you don't have to pay to park, then you can shop, you, know, you can find most of what you want, and you don't have to try to get into the city, you don't have to pay to park that became, um, I think, an issue. So ultimately, uh, it probably did hurt the downtown stores, but then they were, I think the stores in general were able to keep in business because they made a lot of money in suburbia. Oh yeah, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned the, Ven the Vendome, what was that? That was a, I think it was an entire floor on Kaufman's and it was the high-end Kaufman's merchandise and there were people who said, um, and that w it was driven by Edgar Kaufman's wife, um, Lillian. And there were people who may have said kind of cynically, that was Kaufman's response to Horns. And to Horns' reputation as the fashion store was opening the Vendome. But it was definitely very high end, classy shopping in Pittsburgh for fashion and for gifts. When, when Pittsburgh got serious about urban renewal, did that hurt the downtown stores? Um, yes, and that's a whole, I think Horns fared a little bit better than Kaufman's, and it's kind of ironic because Edgar Kaufman was a huge driver 
behind urban renewal. And the urban renewal that took out the Lower Hill District and those residential neighborhoods, and as they, as they basically knocked down the residential neighborhoods to build, um, I'm not sure what they put in there first. They were going to put in an opera house, but that never happened. Um, but as they did the urban renewal for the Lower Hill District, that affected, because it basically took away sh shoppers for whom it was easy to get downtown. I think it probably affected Horn or Kaufman's a little bit more. Horn's activity was more the development of Gateway Center, which... Um, Again, where we're sitting. Yeah, which may have <laughs> actually brought close shoppers to them in um, business people. And then Horns, I think, had, I think they had retail space in Gateway. I'm not sure which Gateway building. They had their piano salon because they were rolling the Steinway pianos a lot across Stanwyck Street to get them to the new studio space. When did the stores pass out of the ownership of the original families? Um, for Horns, I think it was, and they, bo they both, I'll take a step back, they both kind of paralleled each other because they ended up with the jet where there were no more family to run the stores. So Edgar Kaufman had a son. His son was interested in art and did not want to do a retail career. So Edgar Kaufman folded Horn or folded Kaufman's into a consortium. And I'm not sure if it was federated department stores, but it was basically a big holding company. And the same thing happened to Horn's but I don't think that happened to them until later, maybe the 1970s. And then that was eventually their, um, their demise as um, they passed completely out of the families, passed into holding companies. They were both owned by the May Company at one point. Yeah, they were both they? by May at one company, by Federated, and that was on... I think the 80s, 90s, into the early 2000s, and it was sort of like a long, sad decline for both stores. And you say that uh, Horns, in its last year, had a name change. They, the they changed it, I think, to, I think, I'm not sure if it became a Lazarus. Yeah, la I have my notes here. Yeah, Lazarus. it became a yeah. Lazarus, and I think it only lasted about a year or so. And then there was a short-lived Lazarus farther up in the city. And I, I think one of them, I think it might have been Horns, one of them endured a little bit longer in, in some entities in the suburbs. So I think the Horns at... Oh, the suburban stores yeah, outlasted the downtown stores? They, um, and I, this is terrible, I'm not sure if it was Kaufman's or Horns, but one of them moved, I think, under... And it might have been under a Macy's banner to one of the big regional malls. But it's kind of sad. But well, it was national. That happened national. Instead of ending on a sad note, why don't you talk about what it would have been like to be a kid and go into these department stores at Christmas? Oh. And I was a bigger kid. I mean, I was a teenager by the time we came to Pittsburgh. And yes, we did go down at Christmas. So I did not get the little kid experience think my husband may have. My little kid experience was in Cleveland. But Christmas was a huge, huge thing. Although again, Kaufman's Santa Claus came on a huge giant ship in a big giant screaming ad. Horns just announced Santa will be in the children's department. And the one I liked was that the children's department do not have to take an elevator so there will be no screaming. You can come right off the stairs into the children's department, visit Santa. I think it was probably very much like the Christmas story scene with Santa. <laughs> um, Horns tried to keep theirs a little bit low key, although one of the kids writing in, I think it's one of the department store blogs, talked about how Horns took one of the elevators and turned it into a spaceship. So Santa came to horns 
on the good ship Lollipop and landed um, one of the wharfs on the Allegheny and then had a parade and he came in and he was ensconced in his Santa throne and then weeks of visiting Santa at Christmas. And then other, Kaufman's was very similar, but the one thing that Horns did leave, and I don't know how many people who see this still actually know that it dates back to 1954, and that's the, um, the light up Christmas tree on the corner of what's now the Highmark building. So when the building was sold to Highmark, at some point they transferred some of that infrastructure, and I don't know if it involved funding to Highmark, but every year that, that tree still goes up, I think right before light up night, and they light it at light up night, and that was the Horns Christmas decor from 1954. And I think they did it every year except for the 70s when they, it was the, that wasn't lit during the energy crisis, but it's been lit since. So you've written two books about Pittsburgh department stores. Uh, are there more department stores to write about, or have you caught the bug about writing books? Well, there's more department stores to write about. But while we were at the History Center, there's so much 18th century history, and that is probably like our first love. So I'm actually working on two proposals, one on Logstown, um, down the Ohio, huge 18th century diplomacy and trade center with natives, and on another on Victorian era gardens in Pittsburgh. But yeah, you could write there. If anybody else out there wants to take up department stores, there's a bunch of other interesting ones. We've been speaking with Letitia Stewart Savage. She is the author of two books about department stores in Pittsburgh, Horns and Kaufman's. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Full episodes of PA Books, as well as other PCN programs, are available to stream with the PCN app. Visit PCNTV.com or the App Store for details.